This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on December 5th, 2023. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, I am back in Heidelberg, Germany. I'm at the University of Heidelberg. This is part of my week here, uh, culminating in the giant virus meeting in Tegernsee. Uh, but today, I have a special guest for you. He is in the Department of Infectious Diseases, Molecular Virology, Volker Lohmann. Welcome to TWIV. <laughs> Welcome, Vincent. It's my pleasure. Looks like you have some fans here. Huh? <laughs> I think you have some fans here, to be honest. <laughs> they are all your, your lab, right? No, not all. No, not all. Uh, Who, who's in Volker's lab? Ra raise your hand. Just one. The rest yeah. of you are... Well. Unfortunately, we have a guest today, and uh, he's engaged with uh, the rest of the group. Okay, no problem. But thank you for clapping, and uh, uh, thanks for coming. I want to talk mostly about your work on hepatitis mm -hmm. C virus, right? But let's start first by uh, exploring your history, um, where you're from and where you were educated and trained and so forth. Yeah, actually, I'm <coughs> born not so far from here, about one hour north. Um, so at school, actually, I was... I, I'm not a born virologist, to be honest. <laughs> so I was broadly interested in kind of social sciences, politics, philosophy, literature, also natural sciences. And after school, I was not really sure what to do about. And uh, I went on working for one year to get some money for the study. And in that time, I decided, well, I should, it should be something which is more down to the ground than social sciences. So <laughs> I wanted to study something natural sciences and some natural sciences. And I decided in the end for biology because my talents for physics were limited. And chemistry at that time was kind of uh, told that there is no chance to get a job afterwards because <laughs> chemical industry was down. And... Um, Nobody told me that biology was even worse, <laughs> of course. <laughs> uh, so I studied actually nearby in Mainz. Um, mm -hmm. It's a town close to Frankfurt, a mid-sized town. Um, at that time, uh, the study program in biology was kind of very traditional. So I mostly draw plants uh, or uh, kind of looked in, into animals or mm. did some physiology. And in the later part of my uh, studies, I, I got fascinated by molecular biology so i had a genetics course which really um, uh, um, made me enthusiastic um, i also took microbiology but in biology typically microbiology means uh, in mines it's a wine growing area uh, enology so mm. uh, yeast Jeez, research yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and classical microbiology and uh, so no no word on viruses at all uh, and uh, so i looked for for lab rotation opportunity and so i stretched out for medical faculty and there i just strolled around and uh, got an opportunity in the virology lab uh, and they did some um, herpes virus research and some molecular biology so um, i started up working on herpes virus thymidine kinase mm. uh, expressing E. coli purifying it doing some some biochemical assays I did my diploma thesis on that and um, decided, well, the molecular aspects fascinated me, but herpes viruses were not really uh, my, my, my pleasure. <laughs> uh, and so I wanted to, actually, I wanted to come to Heidelberg at the time and join Heinz Schaller's lab. He's a guru of HPV research mm -hmm. at the time. And I read some papers of Ralph Bartenschlager, who was a kind of a, a PhD student and postdoc. Uh, but then I learned that Ralph Bartenschlager would join our department um, in Mainz uh, because he, he made a detour at Roche in Basel there. It was, let's say, the early 90s. HCV was discovered in 1989. And um, Ralph set up the HCV research program in, at Roche. And then Roche decided to move every virology to England, to UK. And he decided that he did not want to move to mm. the UK and to want to get back to academia. Uh, and so he took the opportunity to get this position in, in, in Mainz because the new head uh, searched for persons, in, uh, person who could kind of uh, give some expertise in molecular biology. And so I had an interview with Ralph and, um, well, it took 10 minutes. <laughs> he uh, said, well, your job will be to set up a cell culture model for HCV. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and what follows was five years of blood, sweat and tears. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so of course I was completely naive. Um, HCB, as I said, was discovered in 1989, and uh, people did whatever virologists do when a new virus is on the ground. They throw it on any kind of cells. Mm. Mm. Uh, if you are happy with like with SARS-CoV-2, it works on many cells. If you are unhappy like with HCV, it works on no cell. Mm. Um, and so, um, of course, our approach was not throwing virus on cells, but uh, rather to get a hand on a cloned viral genome, um, which actually never happened before that somebody tried to establish what we call a reverse genetics model before a cell culture model was mm -hmm. established. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, you have no safe ground. You don't know whether your sequence is right. You don't know whether you yeah. have the right cells. It was a nightmare, to be honest. So Ralph came from Basel with two almost complete genomes. Mm -hmm. He assembled from patients, uh, two different patients. And my first job was to sequence just these two plasmids. It took me three months to sequence 10 KB <laughs> of plasmid it's better, DNA. It's better time. than me. It took me a year to sequence <laughs> poliovirus, seven and a half KB. Uh, okay. It's a bit frustrating because <laughs> nowadays it's an overnight job. You just yeah, yeah, uh, throw the thing in your... Yeah. In a, um, um, so um, so I, I first started to, to kind of assemble this genome. We did a negative control. So, uh, you know, a genome where we knew it was dead. Uh, I established one year... Uh, sensitive detection method because mm. it's let's say you don't have a cell culture model right you cannot ju just take the supernatant and put it on cells and yeah, grow yeah. blacks so um, i wanted to de detect with high sensitivity replication intermediates so something which really had to only happen when the virus replicates and this is for positive strand rna virus negative strand yeah, rna right and doing that with sensitive measures it's it's very difficult, mm. particularly if you start from a plasmid, which contains both, both. strands. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you have to get rid of that. So it, as, as I said, it took me about one year to establish that. Then we did this kind of putting in these synthetic genomes into cells uh, for about a year and nothing happened. So we had this negative control. We never mm. went across the negative control. And well, then at that time, this was still this kind of genome organization we learned from uh, Michael Houghton. So he kind of in, uh, kind of discovered after 15 years HCV. Um, but let's say it ended with a poly U stretch. Mm -hmm. And this was not very kind of typical for, for an RNA virus. So either it's poly A it's, or it's something complicated. And so we came up with the idea that there might be something missing. And I spent another half a year <laughs> uh, to, to try, try to get a hand on what, what so kind of RNA ligation stuff and mm. uh, what, what you now can buy as a kit. So race. Uh, uh, I found something new, but um, it was not the right thing. <laughs> uh, half a year later, it was then published by, by Charlie Rice Group and mm. also by Kunitada Shimotono independently. So it was a kind of very conserved portion of the genome at the very end, 98 bases and called the X-tail. And of course, without that, nothing mm. could have happened okay so uh, we added it we did another approach we failed again so then i kind of had to get onto some safe ground for my phd <laughs> and at that time the first kind of uh, way to purify the polymerase uh, from a becular virus expression model was published and let's say we started then with this project first as a safeguard for our isolate because the polymerase is of course of crucial importance and if this would have been dead for any reason we would have no chance for a working genome and it was active and uh, so I just developed into a project and I spent my PhD then the rest of it on that and then in uh, 1997 I think on the Kyoto meeting that was my first uh, international meeting where I presented the polymerase data Charlie Rice presented mm -hmm. the infectious clone mm -hmm. which meant he had the same approach as we he didn't put it in cells but in a chimpanzee yeah and there yeah. it caused <laughs> infection so this was kind of the formal proof right uh, that this is really the, the entity which causes hepatitis C. And um, of course, the field was enthusiastic because now this was a proof that this genome is working, at least in vivo and chimps. Um, and everybody thought, well, now it's like that to get mm -hmm. a cell culture model. But this wasn't the case. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, we tried again. Um, let's say this way we followed Charlie's approach, which was, let's say, HCV is a uh, hepatitis virus now as a general are the most diverse group of viruses. You know, if you look at, so people think task of two is diverse because we have this many variants, but they pass through billions or millions of people. Mm -hmm. In HCV, you'd never find two identical genomes in a patient. Um, so you never are sure whether what you have is something functional mm -hmm. or whether there's anything deleterious in there. And therefore, uh, we followed Charlie's approach, which was um, to try to find kind of the minimal consensus sequence in one patient mm. because this should have the least chance 
to have a, a deleterious error in it. So we went back to our patient, we kind of resequenced everything. We had some 20 something deviations from that sequence. Still, it didn't work. And that was toward the end of and my- And you're still in your PhD, right? <laughs> it was still at the, it was kind of in the writing phase. And at that time, mm. typically I would have moved <laughs> after five years, but I was not done with HCV to be honest. Mm. And because at that time then, um, related fields like uh, flavivirus Kunjin uh, developed these replicant models, so selectable replicants. So they put in a selectable marker, which uh, kind of uh, um, um, uh, you, you put to, to take a poison onto the cells, you put in the virus, and the cell only survives as the virus replicates because he gives the detox mm -hmm. for the poison. Mm -hmm. And this allows you kind of to select for cells having the virus. And let's say our feeling was that. Mm, um, it's, it's mostly the sensitivity issue we might have with this kind of mm -hmm. sensitive detection methods we have. And to be honest, the entire field struggled with that. Nobody had something replicating on, although it yeah. was clear this yeah. clone was functional. That was, that was a conundrum. And to be honest, that's also a very good example uh, that uh, science needs collaboration and also competition mm -hmm. because Charlie's clone would never have worked in cell culture. Uh, we learned then later on. Um, so we had the right genome in the end, the right genotype, and that was kind of the uh, the thing. And let's say when we had this consensus genome, it didn't work as a full virus. We went for this replicant concept. So that was what I developed kind of in my early postdoc time. I first tried it with a reporter. So mm -hmm. uh, so firefly luciferase, so this kind of enzyme from fireflies which mm -hmm. makes them glow. It's mm -hmm. very sensitive. Um, and I went with this model through several cell lines because we still didn't know what, what would support HCV replication. So uh, we ended up with, let's say, HH7 with a two-fold difference to negative control. Mm -hmm. so and was, HH is a human It's a human cell. hepatoma cell line. It's, it's, right. Let's say if you do virology research, we need something easy to grow. Yeah. Yeah. And so we typically use cells which are from tumors. And of course, if you work with the liver tropic virus, you typically circle around Mm -hmm. something which comes from the liver and uh, you need something which grows independently. So if you take out living liver cells, Brahmi hepatocytes, they won't grow in culture. You can, s <clears throat> first of all, you need a donor, <laughs> mm. which is not trivial. Um, and second, uh, they won't grow. So you typically need something which uh, divides uh, indefinitely. And this is either by tumor or by, by kind of genetic manipulation. And HH7 was a kind of derived from a tumor, I think in the early 70s. Mm -hmm. So it was on mm -hmm. the market. There are others like HEPG2 and which are very uh, often used in virology. So that's, it's kind of the panel of cells people typically use when it's about mm -hmm. the liver. Mm -hmm. And only, of course, I used uh, kind of 10, 20 different cell, uh, cell lines and uh, HH7 were the one where we had this twofold difference. This is in the replicon assay, this right? Replicon so assay. we should say the replicon is missing structural proteins, it, this right? Is, uh, the virus cannot spread, yes. Yeah, so but it just, it, the RNA will replicate in the, the cell, The RNA replicate, right? and by that, it will generate, uh, because it's a positive strand RNA, so it's a messenger RNA-like molecule, mm -hmm. and this will then generate uh, um, this light evol uh, em emitting right. enzyme, right. and this we can measure in a very quantitative, very nice way. Okay. But it was kind of let's say, not enough to live and too much to die. So twofold, when you showed that to Ralph, what did he say? Mm, he was not overly excited. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but of course, we had uh, a second uh, arrow, uh, uh, which was this selectable approach. So mm -hmm. to couple uh, the survival of the cell okay. Okay. Uh, with yeah, the survival yeah. of the virus. Um, and um, this was, uh, it's, it's, it's like a fairy tale kind of. So I constructed those, of course, in parallel. Uh, you put them in the cells, you put on the selection marker, it means the cells will die. Mm -hmm. So I did this experiment, I went to holiday, <laughs> I came, came, by, uh, came back and um, of course we again had uh, controls, so uh, a replicon which should be dead. So I took the blades out of the incubator, I swirled them, all the dead cells went off and with the wild type, so the supposed to be replicating thing, we had something like 20 colonies and mm -hmm. with the control it was only one. Mm -hmm. Better than twofold, yeah. Better than twofold, yeah. <laughs> and then it's a kind of a, it was kind of a black and white thing. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so we grew them up, and then um, uh, I did this kind of uh, northern blot, which is a very traditional, not very sensitive, mm -hmm. but very specific method to see uh, to detect RNA. And with that, we really got kind of a, the viral genome visible in mm. biochemical amounts in these kind of cell clones. Um, and uh, it took 
kind of uh, another year to understand, uh, let's say, when you do this reverse genetic stuff, you can generate immense amounts of genome copies. Mm -hmm. So we put in billions mm -hmm. of copies into the cells and we ended up with 20 colonies. So mm -hmm. it doesn't seem to be very efficient. Yeah. Yeah. And the mystery in the, in the end was, of course, that uh, we found mutations in these clones. Uh, by that, uh, we were scooped by Charlie. <laughs> he published it earlier in Science. We were kind of half a year later in JVI. We were a very small group, actually. So it was mm. a bit like David against Goliath. <laughs> uh, so uh, we had were three PhD students. Um, uh, um, Charlie had this uh, kind of group of experienced postdocs, all from Russia. Um, <laughs> they were really, really bright uh, and, and, and talented. Um, so they, whenever our sequence was published, they kind of uh, uh, let it resynthesize and they were earlier in, in kind of describing these adaptive mutations. But this was in the end the reason that we succeeded and he failed with his genome. Mm -hmm. Because by chance, because living in Europe, um, we um, worked with genotype 1B. So as I said, hepatitis C is a very diverse group of viruses. Mm. So we have eight genotypes nowadays, many subtypes, and they differ dramatically. So 30% uh, between genotypes, mm. between subtypes, even 15, more than 15%. That's a lot. So uh, so humans differ uh, in 0.1%. Yeah. yeah. Um, so and and um, in America, uh, 1A genotype 1A was the most prevalent mm -hmm. genotype. So Charlie worked on a 1A isolate, and we worked on a 1B isolate. And uh, later on, we understood, it took years for that, um, that only genotype 1B needs only one mutation to adapt to HH7 cells. It took me another 15 years to understand the mechanism about that. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and for genotype 1A or all the others, you need more than one mutation. So the chance to get that in such a selection approach is yeah. close to zero. So to get one, we have a very high chance. We have a high variability. The virus replicates a bit, mm -hmm. it creates errors. And by these mutations, you randomly select the one that works. If you need two, it's almost impossible. Mm. And that was the reason that Charlie's genome didn't work in this approach, and ours did. So your 20 colonies, they all had a cell culture adapting mutation. In yes. Them. And, and if you introduce that to the beginning material and put it in, you get more than 20 then colonies? Then you get 20,000. All right, good. <laughs> or even more, yeah. And that, uh, yeah, you can work with them. Right? Then you can work with it. And you can also work then with this kind of... Uh, reporter essays. So then you mm -hmm. get more than twofold difference with this phrase. You get right. hundred thousand fold. Yeah. Okay. But still, you had this kind of um, limitation, and that's something uh, probably we can talk later about. That what I'm currently interested in. Um, so we have this huge diversity in the human. By the way, these all these genotypes and subgenotypes. Do they have any phenotypic differences? Are the disease different? Is there uh, any, anything different? At some point, so genotype three, for example, uh, makes more fatty liver. Okay. Uh, so steatosis. Um, beyond that, um, there are no striking differences, okay. but that's kind of also the difficulty because we have to adapt them to cell culture. <clears throat> we cannot look yeah. at what's going on in the patient. You know, you have this diversity of, of, of stuff. Um, and, and we had for 20 years a very hard time uh, to, to get back with this diversity into cell culture models. Because mm. let's say when you have an infectious clone, it's a defined sequence, but it's a defined sequence. It will not change. And... Um, um, let's say this cannot cover the diversity you have in a yeah. patient. And later on, it went worse because, um, as you already pointed out, uh, with the subgenomic replicants, we missed the structure of proteins. So when we tried to put it back, it still didn't produce virus mm. because it seems that these mutations we needed to, to get the virus going in HH7 cells in this hepatoma cell line, and it's still the working horse, to be honest, mm. even after 20, mm -hmm. 20 or more years. Um, they kind of interfered with particle production. And this only changed with a very special isolate, which was uh, found in Japan by Takachi Wakita's group. It's called JFH1. Coming back to the phenotypes uh, mm. this virus is made, J Japanese fulminant hepatitis. Mm -hmm. So it, the idea was to, to catch up patients with certain phenotypes, and this patient suffered from a very severe disease outcome. And this re uh, isolate was really special, and this still the only one replicating as a wild type in regular HH7 cells. So it didn't need adaptive mutation and it was far stronger than whatever we adapted. Mm -hmm. So it, it was kind of a game changer, but... But that, that would make infectious viruses? That would yes. also make infectious viruses. Okay. And, and that's and the only one so far that's done that? No, 
Yeah, uh, but but um, the only one with with a min minimal set of mutations. Okay. So one thing is replicate RNA genome replication, and this JVH one does with an unproven efficiency. So nothing compared to what what else is okay. in the, around the okay. lab. Okay. Okay. Um, particle reduction still is an issue. Uh, so uh, the most efficient one is a not natural combination of structural proteins from a different isolate. Mm. Um, it's another from the same genotype, and that's the downside of JFH1 is genotype 2A. So it's clinically not the most important one. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so it, it was not that important in the end for drug development. Uh, so drug development was mainly done with our stuff, uh, so with the genotype 1 replicants. Replicants, so the drugs were used? Were yeah, they were only replicants. done with replicants, actually. Uh -huh. So all the drugs are on the replicase, are on the RNA synthesis. Oh, there's, there's a protease in there too, right? There's a protease, there's a polymerase, and there the is a yeah. cryptic uh, a protein called NS5A. Mm -hmm. And this is the one where the most efficient drugs ever have been, have been developed against viruses. <laughs> and we don't know what, what the protein does. Not really. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I'm trying to understand that also now for 20 years, I think. <laughs> so we, we so have some ideas, but uh, we, we don't clearly know. So are you still, are you finished with your PhD at this point? Yeah, no, this is... <laughs> <laughs> so this replicant stuff was kind of the first year of my postdoc. Um, and where did you do that? In, in Mainz still. Still, so you stayed still in, in the Barton Schlager, Schlager group, right? Yeah, okay. sure. Actually, the rest of my CV is boring because I stayed in the Barton Schlager group my whole life. <laughs> I'm still kind of in the Barton Schlager, Barton -Schlager group. <laughs> But um, in the, as I said, in the postdoc, I had this ambition to try this replicant approach. And mm. it, to be honest, it was the most frustrating six months of my life when I tried to establish that and saw, seeing first this luciferase data, which were not very mm. promising. Mm. And then it only turned uh, when we got this, uh, this selectable thing got it. running. Yeah. Got it. And then eventually you used the, the infectious clone of, the, what is it, JRA? JRFH? JFH was then JFH. Uh, two years later. This was started in 2005. So, yeah. th no, five, six years, six years later, actually. Okay. So, I, I kept on genotype 1B. I tried to understand, I characterized these adaptive mutations. We had, didn't have a clue what they're doing. Yeah. Um, they were kind of positioned in NS5A. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, Charlie, had, Charlie Weiss had a, a science paper where he characterized first this cluster of mutations in NS5A. And that's a region we're still now working on and trying to understand what it mm -hmm. does. Um, in the polymerase, there were some, some were in the protease, so they were all over the place. Um, but there were the driving ones were in NS5A. And uh, with this tool now at hand, of course, this opened up many, many doors, like you mm. could uh, host factors uh, kind sure. of came into yep. it to place. Of course, the drug development uh, was at that time a real issue. The field was kind of really looking for this model to develop drugs because like the protease is an obvious target mm. and uh, there are many kind of uh, inhibitors in the pipeline already, but there was no way to test them uh, in an authentic model. Mm. And for polymerase, it's even more difficult because let's say the prime drug for polymerase are nucleoside analogs. Uh, so, um, uh, but, but uh, they have to be metabolized and you need them to test them in a living cell. Um, and many companies also did kind of unbiased screening assays. So mm. they have huge compound libraries they just throw it on yeah and look what's yep. working yep. and by that uh bms so bristol myers um found this ns5a inhibitors and the way how it was found that it acts on ns5a a was kind of that it developed resistance in mm -hmm. NS5, resistance mutations in ns5a so right. Right. it's still right. not right. clear what they're doing to be honest okay uh, so there are ideas and concepts but it's not clear how they're working and so when did you come to heidelberg Actually, when we had this kind of uh, um, uh, replicon uh, uh, kind of breakthrough, mm -hmm. of course, Ralph became famous. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, so uh, in the early 2000s, then he applied for professorships. And he, in, in this year, he could have uh, a couple of them. Mm. And he decided to get back to his kind of uh, okay. origin, okay. Uh, Heidelberg, because he found here the research environment uh, most compelling. And... I've stayed with him that long because, you know, we were at the forefront at that time, you know, okay. we, we had invented this model. And so um, he asked, he offered me a, a permanent position here as a researcher uh, to build up my own group. So it was not my vision to, to kind of uh, uh, be the right hand of Ralph. So I had the ambition to, to have a research group, mm -hmm. but, but I also didn't have the ambition to lead an institute because that's more administration in the mm. end than, than mm. research. Uh, so, so I was very happy with this offer. And so I moved with him in 2002 uh, to this place here, not to this building. <laughs> but the university, right? The university, okay. yeah. Um, 
Um, so the, you must have, yesterday I talked about the polio virus infectious clone. You must have been jealous because I made the DNA, put it in cells, and out came virus. One experiment, the first yeah, experiment. Yeah. It's incredible. Yeah. I mean, it really was the first, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So I have to tell you, so I put the DNA into monkey uh, kidney cells, right? And after seven days, there was no cytopathic effect. So I said, well, it doesn't work. But someone said, do the plaque assay on the super date. <laughs> so I took it, and I got plaques. Oh, wow. And so uh, then I did it again, and we got CPE. But the first experiment worked. It's really amazing. But so. these are the great moments, aren't they? So yeah, they're the moments this, uh, you live for. you look at this plate, and you see the plaques, actually. Yeah. Like, like me looking at this plate and uh, yeah. seeing the colonies. I can remember the day I was staining the plates. And, you know, you tilt them so the, mm. the, the, the stain moves away, and you see the plaques and you're like oh my gosh you have a few moments like this in your career yeah sure right? that's right. right you don't have too many but honestly for hcv you would still wait to see for plaques <laughs> yes of course <laughs> got that all right so let's back up a little i want our listeners to understand a little bit about hepatitis c virus and hepatitis c so you said that the virus was identified or the genome was identified in 1989 right that's yep. michael houghton basically michael houghton, yeah. his famous one colony experiment yeah, right but um how long before that did we suspect that there was... It was about 15 years. Yeah. So let's say from the end, it's incredible kind of... There was a very nice uh, review of Michael Houghton and, uh, mm -hmm. uh, about that. So at the end of the 60s, blood donations were mainly done by paid donors. So right. uh, people uh, uh, taking drugs and stuff. And uh, there were mm -hmm. kind of this uh, disease called post-transfusion hepatitis mm. in 33% of transfusions actually wow <laughs> um, and when kind of uh, the system was changed to uh, only voluntary donations it went down to 10 then hepatitis b virus was discovered and it was mm -hmm. clear that this accounted quite a bit uh, for this post-transfusion hepatitis but still after um, diagnostics screens have had been established um, it was clear uh, that there must be something else okay and this was then in the early 70s and um, uh, this was then called non-A, non-A, non-B hepatitis. So hepatitis A was also discovered around that time, mm -hmm. but it's a fecal oral disease. It's not, mm -hmm, right. not transmitted. It's a, it's a picornavirus. It's a picornavirus, yeah. 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 And it's, I'm also working a bit on that now. Um, but it's not transmitted uh, by, by transfusions. So it was clear there must be something else. And um, um, people were looking, I said, 15 years for it. It was clear there must be something. So the uh, experiments, the thriving experiments were done in chimpanzees. Mm -hmm. So you could transmit this thing to a chimpanzee and there also it caused hepatitis. So that was kind of the proof. You could filter it. Right. And right, by that you right. understood that it's a virus. You know, it was not mm -hmm. God given. That's through virus. filter, right? Yeah. yeah. Mm. So it was clear it's a virus. Um, it was not clear what type of virus. And then, uh, as at Michael Houghton, uh, in, uh, uh, it's kind of uh, worked 15 years in, in, in trying they worked on this serum from this infected chimpanzee because there it was clear that it it should have kind of the, the pure entity which causes the disease. And then they made this kind of uh, approach where they kind of cloned everything which is in the serum of this chimpanzee mm -hmm. and proved it with uh, kind of antibodies from patients. Right. Uh, and with that, they got this one clone, which right. was then kind of hepatitis C, uh, the hepatitis C virus genome. And of course, with that, uh, this was a game changer because this was the uh, kind of hour to develop diagnostics mm. and with that you can then prevent of course transfusion hepatitis caused by non-a non-b hepatitis uh, and from 1989 on it was then hepatitis c right and then we had so we had a b c and then sub then we had d delta delta yeah and uh, even e right and even e yeah and uh, we also kind of here in the institute yep. we're working on delta so uh, stefan urban uh, uh mm -hmm. is working for for decades on hepatitis b and he developed an entry inhibitor right and this is now the first in class uh, uh, compound which is approved for therapy of hepatitis delta mm. which uses the same receptor as hepatitis as b, b right uh, b. so how many right now how many people globally are infected with hcv so when i started it was uh, the estimates were 170 million right now now we're about 58 millions uh, infected mm -hmm. right. and there are certain hotspots like egypt uh, where it was they are doing a good job in, in trying to get rid of it, uh, but they they had a kind of more than ten percent of persons infected. It was transmitted by uh, needle sharing on schistosomiasis therapy. Yeah, yeah. right, that's, uh, right. That's, uh, said it's it's kind of a, I think most of HCV transmission was iatrogenic. Hmm. So I think it's in the human population for for centuries, oh no, for for, for uh, thousands of years, 
but let's say this kind of uh, um, um, spread uh, in, in, in this century is mainly managed by, by iatrogenic sources like uh, drug abuse, mm -hmm. and transfusion. Uh, so, the, of course, the, the big wave came from these transfusions uh, or kind of needles which were kind of used in many uh, different mm -hmm. patients and stuff like that. So, if you are infected or you acquire hepatitis C virus, what fraction of the people would have no symptoms whatsoever? Do we know? It's, uh, this is uh, the one million dollar question actually <laughs> we, we don't know uh, okay so um, because it's mostly asymptomatic uh, thirty percent will kind of uh, get rid of it mm -hmm. but seventy percent will get a persistent infection let's say the the the, the acute hepatitis phase can be uh, a hepatitis so like with jaundice right. typically mild mm -hmm. but in most cases it's just like a feverish cold uh, you, they just real, don't realize it and um, there have been now uh, kind of there is one group in baltimore trying to understand that they have a, it's a b bash cohort they 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 are kind of monitoring prisoners injecting mm. drugs and to catch up people at the earliest point where they get the disease or where they, where, they, where they get in contact to understand what's happening in the acute phase. Mm -hmm. This is really challenging. Uh, it, 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 it takes a lot of effort and we, we really don't understand that. And another uh, exciting, not it's not exciting, it's, it's, uh, it, it's, um, it's an RNA virus, you know. Mm -hmm. RNA viruses typically are not made to be persistent because um, they have to expose themselves all the time. They don't have a stable intermediate like HIV has or like hepatitis B virus has or like helpless viruses do. Uh, they 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 have to to kind of uh, replicate always uh, the whole time to to stay alive in a, in a in a body and therefore typically they they follow a hit and run strategy so they enter they replicate like hell they want to get spread and then they're mm. gone the immune system mm. defeats them but hepatitis C is one of the few ex examples where an RNA virus which mm. kind of has to be um, active all the time still gets into persistence at a very very high level seventy percent so seventy percent of and people who are infected yes. have a persistent infection. Yeah. How long does that last? Their lifetime. Lifetime. Um, and some of them develop liver cancer, right? Yes. What? What? Roughly, how many? So let's say it's about thirty percent of these persistently infected will develop a cirrhosis. Right. And then you have a strongly increased uh, uh, kind of chance to get liver cancer. So mm. also there, we don't understand the mechanism completely. It's thought that it's mainly mediated by this chronic infection. So I think the understanding that Chronic infections, kind of, mm. and this cell turnover, which is stranded by that, uh, uh, inflammation, inflammatory processes are a main cause of, of cancer. But we also follow some tracks that HCV itself does contribute to liver cancer to some extent. Um, but there's no, there's no oncogene as in other viruses, right? Uh, to be honest, uh, we have 10 gene products and each mm. of them has been f um, shown <laughs> to have oncogenic potential. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> Whatever assay you do, uh, it's, it's kind of, if you overexpress it in a mouse, uh, you might get in certain strains some cancer. Uh, mm. Core, the capsid protein was kind of suspected uh, for a long time and S5A, my pet was, uh, but, but it's, it's, not, it's not an oncogene in a classical sense. Um, okay, yeah. and, and also in the tumors, the virus replicate less than in the surrounding tissue. Mm. So it's, it's more the onset of, of, of the tumor genesis that the virus drives than the maintenance. So, so during this chronic replication, why isn't the immune system taking care of the virus? That's, that's an interesting question. You're following it. <laughs> so we have a kind of a, a huge research consortium, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a collaborative research uh, a grant um, from the um, DFG, uh, where we try to understand persistence and clearance of hepatotropic viruses. And I'll try to do it with hepatitis C compared mm. to hepatitis A, which never gets persistent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and never causes cancer either, right? No. Uh, right. So you get cleared all the times. And uh, so we try to understand how they, they are different in terms of triggering the cell intrinsic in, innate immunity. Um, but let's, uh, let's say, um, I think the trick for of HCV is that in comparison to other RNA viruses, it's a low replicator. Mm -hmm. So um, and that's something we're actively working on at the moment. Um, so we found indications that, uh, and uh, we do that in in, uh, in historic samples on, of liver transplantations, where we see that the virus involves into something which replicates far better than a standard isolate, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and uh, that uh, in an acute infection or the samples we ha we have from acute cases never have this kind of high replicator signature. That means 
that in a regular infection, the virus rather, it has the potential to replicate to very high levels, but it doesn't do it. Mm -hmm. And uh, the idea is that it kind of keeps its uh, replication level down to fly under the radar of adaptive immunity. And the adaptive immune system is kind of uh, made in a way that, you know, you, you generate kind of cells that um, in the, are, can kill the infected cells, so mm -hmm. CDA T cells. Mm -hmm. And um, it's clear from chimpanzee experiments, they're now not, not no longer possible, but in the 90s they have been done. So that when you deplete um, CDA T cells, for example, in chimpanzee, it gets uh, um, persistent, and when you deplete CDA, CD4 T cells, it gets persistent. So mm -hmm. you need adaptive immunity to clear the virus, mm -hmm. but in 70% of humans, it fails to do so. And um, I think it's a combination of low replication and high variability, mm -hmm. because, um, um, you know, there is a limited um, kind of, uh, these T cells uh, uh, recognize a very short fragment of the viral uh, prote proteome. Mm -hmm. And um, if this is not essential for the virus, it just mutates out of that. So it's a T cell escape, basically. It's, yeah. Yeah, yeah, It's yeah. a T cell, it's a B cell escape. It has some kind of decoys mm. in its uh, envelope proteins, which mask kind of the, uh, the, the important epitopes for neutralization. Mm. So it's a combined thing. Um, we, we still don't understand it in every detail. I have to say that's why we still have this collaborative sure. research grant. Right. So we have people in Freiburg looking at the immune response in, in humans. Yep. Um, yep. Not only HCV, of course, it's the consortium is on HPV also and HDV uh, and also HEV. So we cover all the whole alphabet of mm -hmm. hepatotropic viruses. But, uh, but um, let's say while for HPV, the persistent mechanism is relatively obvious that it has this very stable so-called CCC DNA. Mm -hmm. uh, for HCV, it's not clear at all. And um, I think the, the concept is about that, you know, the the... the the adaptive immunity gives a shot at the virus, right? But um, if it doesn't, uh, if it cannot clear it within a decent time frame, it decides: Well, uh, shall I kind of uh, murder myself, or should I consider that it might be something from my own body? Mm. And so that uh, these T cells, we call it exhaustion. Uh, um, so the, kind of the T cell response is kind of burned, uh, um, and then. But but I think it's kind of a natural reaction of the body that if it cannot clear it, he leaves yeah, it off yeah. because in the end it will destroy the liver um, and, and the, we cannot live without a liver. So uh, yeah. it's a wise decision. So have people tried checkpoint inhibitors to revive the T-cell? The, the, you know, the uh, let's say, um, um, fortunately, the checkpoint inhibitors came after efficient drugs against HCV. Ah, okay. <laughs> okay, so the drugs basically changed everything. It changed right. everything. So right. um, I'm now kind of a dinosaur. <laughs> uh, sometimes I call me uh, the last of the Mohicans. <laughs> okay. Uh, still working on HCV. Uh, because, in, uh, let's say, based on this um, replicant stuff, it, it took another 15 years. Let's say the first um, direct anti acting antivirus were out, um, let's say around t t 2010. Mm -hmm. Let's say up to then, uh, it's also uh, peculiar, um, HCV was treated before it was discovered. So the first uh, attempts to treat uh, non-A, non-A, B hepatitis with interferon were done before mm. 1989, mm. <laughs> but with a very low efficiency. And mm. of course, interferon therapy is nothing uh, which is, uh, um, uh, it's, it has a very high uh, degree of um, um, side effects. Sure. And you have to yeah. do it for one year and stuff. And this, But this was state of the art. Then ribavirin was added. Mm -hmm. That's a mysterious drug which acts against many viruses maybe it's a mutator right yeah, that's one 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 aspect <laughs> of it but it could also be an immune stimulator at some point uh -huh. okay it's it inhibits impdh so it's it's kind of um, it also kind of messes up with nucleoside me me metabolism mm. so there are many many ideas on how rubberin works because for polio it, yeah, I know, it increases I know the, paper, yeah. the, Cameron, the yeah. mutation and it pushes it over the error threshold. Absolutely. It's, it's also been shown for HCV yeah. in vivo and also in cell culture that it's a mutator, but it could be the mode of action, but there are also alternative explanations. Yeah. So nobody really understands, to be honest. Um, but this, let's say, had a cure rate. There we had genotype differences. So genotype 3 mm. was cured up to 90%. Genotype 1, which was here the most prevalent, was about 50%. Mm -hmm. And let's say after one year of blood sweat and the therapy, because it's this kind of a fever, depression, yeah. ribavirin makes uh, uh, anemia. Um, mm -hmm. So this was, of course, not, not ideal. And um, yeah. then 
the first antiviral drugs were added with protease inhibitor mm -hmm. because they, they were developed far before cell culture models and so they were in the pipeline already. Because you just need the protein to You just need the protein to, to, yeah. to, 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 to yeah. screen for them. Um, and they were added. They also had some side effects. Um, uh, but, but then in 2015, 2016, um, uh, it was kind of a, a blow. Uh, so nobody would, if you would have told anybody in 2010 that would, would have a pill in 2015, one pill a day, mm -hmm. a combination therapy. You always need combination therapies because we have a highly mutating virus. Mm -hmm. Like you HIV, would, right? Basically. Like HIV, yeah. you would get resistance like that mm -hmm. uh, within days. Um, but, but let's say there were two real game changers. Um, so one was sofosbuvir. So this was developed by um, a, a pharma set, a small pharmaceutical company mm -hmm. focused on... And Gilead bought this then for $11 billion. <laughs> <laughs> and they, I think they earned $11 billion in the first year wow. <laughs> of therapy. And the second one was um, um, uh, NS5 inhibitors. So now we have kind of different regimens. All of them contain NS5 inhibitors. Mm -hmm. And they were first discovered by um, a set by BMS. But then it was kind of after uh, the companies were on track of those, uh, every company came, came around with NS5 inhibitors. And in this combination, Gilead was the first uh, to, to have a kind of a, a one in uh, one pill a day combination. Uh, others then followed, but but let's say most companies, uh, um, because they lacked, you need you need you needed kind of um, uh, a safe spot uh, to uh, get around to resistance. Mm -hmm. And this was mm -hmm. the nucleoside inhibitor, the fosbuvir, but it was not efficient enough to cure. But it's incredibly, uh, it has an incredibly high barrier to resistance. And then you have to add an, uh, a second compound, which kind of uh, then kills the virus off. And this was these NS5A inhibitors. However, their barrier to resistance is very low, mm -hmm. uh, but mm -hmm. they're extremely, they work in the picomolar range. So uh, people have calculated that you need less molecules of the inhibitor than you have NS5A molecules in the cell. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's, it's, it's really a mystery. So one idea is that they kind of, um, NS5A is a very dynamic protein. It's supposed to form dimers or even multimers and it, it has so many functions that it has to change uh, conformations in mm. between. Mm. Uh, and one idea is that it kind of arrests this proteins, kind of freezes it in a certain conformation, and that's why how they work. But uh, it's still not clear. But it's also one fascinating aspect that we still don't understand how they work. And it would be, of course, a great opportunity also for other viruses to develop mm -hmm. inhibitors if you understand once the mode of action of these um, uh, compounds. So every pill has three? No, two, actually. Just only. two? Just two. Uh, and so that's it's sufficient because for the, HIV two is not enough. I know, right? I know. Right? But, but um, it's um, let's say the uh, Gilead test kind of uh, three two inhibitor regimens. So Fosbuvir is the key for the resistance, mm -hmm. and different NS five A inhibitors with okay. different uh, kind of so several generations, and they have kind of the only uh, regimen with three inhibitors. They mm -hmm. also have one with uh, polymerase, NS five A, and protease. But this is kind of a rescue treatment uh, if people fail. So right. the standard therapy is 95% cure rate. It's, 95% across all the genotypes. Across all the genotypes. It's a bit less for genotype 3 mm -hmm. because all the stuff was initially developed against genotype 1, our replicant. Mm. Um, uh, so it, it, it turned around, whereas it was most efficient genotype 3 with interferon therapies. It's now least efficient, but it's still incredibly efficient. Uh, so and the, it's cure. It's really cure. The five percent who don't respond. What's the, what? What's the problem? Resistance or? Um, let's say uh, resistance is a minor problem, to be honest. Um, and typically, it's it's recurrence. So uh, if you retreat them, then with a more harsh kind of regimen, like with the three inhibitors, you get. You get almost two hundred. Okay. There are several several con certain conditions, like of course, if you are far in liver disease, so mm -hmm. decompensated cirrhosis, or problems with the kidney and stuff like that. There, it might be mm -hmm. sometimes challenging, but uh, you could treat, I would say, almost all patients nowadays. And, and so these are, would be virus-free then. Yes. After how many months of treatment is this? It's only eight to 12 weeks. Eight to 12 weeks. In some, and it's 16, and then you follow up for 12 weeks, mm -hmm. and then you look, and if it's gone, then... So how do you look? By PCR? By PCR, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then below a certain level, then, then you're, you're cured. Yeah. Yeah. You could be reinfected, right? Absolutely. And that's, that's, 
kind of uh, one thing. We still don't have a vaccine for good reasons, actually. Um, and that, that's kind of what keeps the translational aspect of HCV mm -hmm. research mm -hmm. alive uh, at the moment. Um, it's incredibly difficult uh, um, to develop a vaccine against HCV for many reasons, actually. Um, and of course, the only uh, we, we know that from people inject drugs um, that you can be reinfected many times. So even if you have been infected, you presumably have some kind of B and T cell immunity, you can still get reinfected. Absolutely. So it doesn't work. No. So, so in some cases it does. So some it's it's there is no kind of general consensus. So it's, when it does work, is it antibodies or T cells or both? People think both. Both. Let's say yeah. in the vaccine world, there are kind of the B cell believers and yeah. the T cell believers. Because you need to know to make a vaccine, right? <laughs> What's important? Absolutely. Right, and um, let's say the first um, uh, bigger trial. You, you know, the problem is if you, you there is no good cell, uh, animal model for HCV. You can't use non-human primates, right? No. Nope. Chimpanzees were the only ones. Right? Chimpanzees were the only ones. But all banned. the other non-human they, won't they work. don't work. Yeah. We have related viruses, so now we have also Norway retropathy virus. See, that's the other thing. We were lucky. We made a transgenic with the receptor, and that mm. was it. <laughs> <laughs> so two things. <laughs> yeah, people, but I know people have tried making transgenic mice with all the entry factors. It absolutely. doesn't work because there are more than one, right? It, it does work to a very, very, very minor extent. So yeah. Alex Bloss uh, spent years of his life on that. Um, um, it, it, it works in principle. The entry works. Uh, replication to a very minor extent. Uh, so they had sophisticated readout strategies mm. uh, where they could okay. detect okay. minor aspects. But we don't have an animal model. And, and that's of course, a major, you, you, you want to challenge, uh, so you need to test the vaccine in a way that you vaccinate, ideally an animal, and, and then you sure. bring in the virus and see that it protects, and right. we don't have that. We could do that in, with a related virus, but it's not the same thing. Yeah, you're just, you were just going to say which virus. So red hepasi virus has been discovered, Rattapassi, Norway okay. red hepasi virus, it also works in mice to some extent, and um, this would be a nice model, but let's say particularly structural proteins are very different. Uh, so they're not as diverse. They have a very different structure. And for the mm. B cell vaccine, they would not be uh, the, an ideal model. For T cell vaccine, probably, but still you could not use the HCV vaccine on the hepatitis virus. It, they're too diverse. Uh, okay. So you see kind okay. of uh, some, some uh, um, uh, res residues in the polymerase are conserved, but that's it. Uh, so that's why do we need a vaccine at all? Would, wouldn't it be possible to use antivirals to eliminate uh, all infections? Uh, I mean, people are the only ones infected. There's no other reservoir, right? There is no other reservoir, that's true. But, but um, the problem is um, you hardly can eradicate a virus with a, a treatment because people can get re reinfected, right? Mm. And um, um, it would, the, prob the other problem is uh, all the hepatitis, hepatitis uh, these chronic diseases are kind of called a silent epidemic. So I if you would really set up a huge screening program for the whole population to identify all the carriers, treat them really uh, consistently, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. then you're right, it might happen. But you don't know who's infected, right? There may be people yeah. infected that have no symptoms, so, so you would So you would it. have to screen the entire population. Exactly right. And that's what's happening, for example, in Egypt. Uh, but in the US, for example, despite having this 90% or almost 100% cure rates, uh, we haven't seen a decline in cases over the last uh, seven, eight years because of the opioid crisis. Correct, right. Uh, right. So we, we cure as many people as they get reinfected. Mm -hmm. I think um, the treatment still is no bargain. So it's very... The drugs are very cheap, uh, but they're sold initially. They were sold for twenty to forty thousand dollars per therapy, mm. because the argument was well, and the ferron therapy with the first line inhibitors costs kind of twenty thousand euros per cure, but you only cure fifty percent. Right. So we can take <laughs> the same amount. <laughs> you know, we treat a cure hundred percent, right. and we can take the same amount of money. <laughs> I don't know what the bargain prices are now for uh, for therapies, but they're still. I think in the industrialized world, they're still pretty high. They, there are special programs for countries like uh, Egypt, India. Mm -hmm. um, but but um, I, th I don't think that, for example, a, a person who injects drugs will get repetitive therapies uh, uh, whenever he gets reinfected. I think the insurance companies will say at some point, uh, your problem. But it, would, it should work in theory. No, in man, theory, no matter how many times you're infected, the drugs should still work. Right? Yeah, yeah they, they should, uh, let's say. 
we there are now reports on kind of um, exotic variants coming from sub-Saharan Africa, mm -hmm. which do have some sophosphate resistance. So mm. uh, we, you never know what's gonna what's gonna happen in the future. That's that's a bit the problem. Um, and um, in theory, you could kind of eradicate HCV with the drugs, but um, in practice, it would be it would probably require that you set up uh, huge screening programs. And the right, WHO right, has right. set up kind of this vision to eradicate uh, HCV until 2030, as well as HPV. But um, I think uh, this will not gonna work with, without a vaccine. Um, but but this vaccine development is extremely challenging, to be honest. Well, if you don't <clears throat> if you don't have an animal model, uh, how can you make a vaccine? They had, they had B vaccine. Was there an animal model that they could use to test that? Um, um, to be honest, I don't know. Yeah, uh, probably they took the chimpanzee at that time. Oh, this is a long time ago. It's yeah, a long time ago. Um, let's say if, uh, what they're gonna. So the first clinical trial on the T cell vaccine was done on people who inject drugs because you need a population mm. which has a decent risk of get, getting infected of course. at a certain yeah. time uh, time frame, like. With SARS-CoV-2, it was kind of easy. It was a very pandemic. Easy. Yeah, very easy. Yeah, <laughs> you had a, uh, we could could have done it almost everywhere. But but here we have a, to, to find a population which is at risk to get infected, and these are only pivots actually. And um, uh, you might imagine how challenging it it is to do a clinical trial on a vaccine with uh, people who inject drugs because the kind of coherence to the mm -hmm. will probably not be the greatest. And there are also arguments that the immune system might be compromised. Uh, by, by the um, and so the recent idea is really to to establish a model co model called CHIM, so controlled human infection model. Mm -hmm. That means to uh, recruit volunteers who would get the candidate vaccine and then get challenged uh, by mm -hmm. uh, by real virus infection. Um, and of course, let's say um, it's it's a very intense discussion at the moment. There are initiatives coming ma mainly from the US mm. and. To be honest, I think it would be the only way, uh, probably, to get to a vaccine to go through such a model. But of course, um, uh, there are also arguments against it because um, you have to wait until the people get persistent. Mm. Yeah. So when you challenge them, so you give them the vaccine candidate, you infect them with an inoculum. That there are kind of huge discussions about uh, what inoculum to be used. Sure. Uh, so right. genetically modified, it shouldn't be a, a, a genetically modified virus. It cannot be because uh, HH7 cells, which would be the only model, model for, um, are not kind of uh, eligible uh, uh, for, for human applications. Mm -hmm. um, um, so uh, the, the idea is uh, to, to kind of uh, generate some, some uh, purified virus from patients. But again, a chronic patient. Uh, so we have now evidence that uh, we have this kind of very highly replicating isolates evolving in liver transplant patients who are immune suppressed. Mm -hmm. uh, we have the signature of this kind of replica high replicator phenotype. Um, of course, would it be good or bad to have them in the inoculum? Because typically they're not found in acute infection. Probably mm -hmm. the, they would promote kind of clearance by themselves without mm -hmm. a vaccine. Yeah. So it's, it's a difficult uh, kind of... But in any case, you would have to wait until people get persistent. And that means they have passed through a, an infection without curing it. And it means also, that's uh, what, what the guys in Freiburg in our research consortium um, have, have found. Um, um, also what you observed in people after cure, there is what they call an immunolog immunological scar. Mm -hmm. So the T cell response is kind of burned against the main epitopes. And when you come with the second virus, there, is, there will be mm. no, no T cell response on the same strength as you will have it in initial infection. Yeah. So, and, so if you have people who are persistently infected, a challenge, you, you infect people, wait till they get persistent. Can you at that point stop it with antivirals? Absolutely. So that's probably why the challenge is being considered because yeah, we have these antivirals yeah. that can stop at any stage, right? Yeah, that's, that's the advantage. And that's kind of, um, uh, and of course you can also argue, well, uh, even if they have this immunological scar, how big is their chance to get infected a second time if they are not people who inject drugs. Mm, yeah. mm. Uh, so probably the risk is limited. There are also limited cases of uh, kind of like uh, fulminant hepatitis. Yeah. Um, mm. You could, mm. uh, it, it's, uh, but but I think the, the 
the risk is not very high. Still, it's an ethical consideration. Yeah? So, um, um, but but um, as I said, I think without this model, it will be extremely difficult um, to to get forward with a with a vaccine. So, no vaccines have ever been tested. There have been, as I said, one uh, phase two trial. Okay. But this was, what was kind the, of what was the immunogen for that? It was uh, a, t, a pure T cell vaccine, a, B, a T cell vaccine, so yeah. it a, a adenoviral vector, uh -huh. um, and, and producing own, P, T cell epitopes. Yes, uh, but it was uh, kind of the whole replicase, okay, an adenoviral vector, so uh, oh, okay. protease, NS5A, and mm -hmm. other couple of proteins. Uh, put in an adenoviral vector. Mm -hmm. uh, I think for uh, licensing re reasons, it was a certain genotype one B isolate that was used, which probably was not the best choice in mm. the U.S. population because their genotype 1A is yeah. more prevalent, <laughs> uh, or genotype, one, uh, genotype 3. Yeah. Um, and um, in that study, they, it was done in people on inject drugs, as I said. Um, they couldn't find any... They found a T-cell response. That's, uh, they could characterize that. Mm -hmm. But uh, in terms of outcome, and that's what we're looking for, right? You will not have a sterilizing immunity. You will not prevent infection. Mm -hmm. uh, what the aim of a vaccine would be um, to train the immune system better than a natural infection does on um, a kind of counteracting an, a new incoming and preventing per, uh, persistence. That's, yeah. that's, that's mm -hmm. the aim. Uh, mm -hmm. And, and uh, in this cohort, there was unfortunately zero difference between mm -hmm. uh, the uh, uh, placebo control and the vaccinated control. Yeah, maybe the polymerase is not enough. Maybe you need other things. Yeah, it right? was uh, kind of, I said, the whole replica. Yeah, so it's a 6, six KB yeah. Uh, uh, so um, maybe you need structural proteins. Yeah. So so I think uh, as I said there are these two schools of T cell and B cell, and I think we are also having. I'm also part of a, a consortium here in Germany. It's uh, from the German Center of Infectious Research, where we mm -hmm. try to develop a vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, we want to focus on optimized B cell epitopes. So the neutralizing antibodies are mainly against the protein called E2. Mm -hmm. Um, but as I said, the natural version of it um, has several decoys, uh, so hypervariable regions, which kind of uh, are, are set to confuse the adaptive immune response. And uh, uh, collaborators of us, Thomas Pietschmann and Thomas Grey, um, they, they want to establish optimized B-cell epitopes. And uh, we're going to uh, um, try to make replicants kind of to, to generate vectors which uh, just are based on HCV. And mm -hmm. to, to, use, to try to establish that as a vaccine candidate. Um, mm -hmm. But, but um, I think it will need uh, a B cell and T cell response for sure. Uh, yeah. Will... So uh, I'm sure people are trying mRNA vaccines, Absolutely, right? Absolutely, yeah. That's a, also working on that. Mm -hmm. But also there, it's, uh, um, let's say there were several aspects. First, you have to cover the genetic diversity. Mm. Okay. So. Um, uh, some labs try approaches like multitopes, so they try to go for combined selected epitopes across mm -hmm. genotypes mm -hmm. in an artificial kind of protein uh, to, to broaden the uh, immune response. Uh, I would uh, prefer to to um, to use consensus variants of certain of different genotypes, so to cover the most important ones, mm -hmm. so genotype one A, one B, and three, and probably also genotype four if you want to go for Egypt. So you, you would have to tailor it uh, probably to, towards also the country uh, where you want to apply it. Um, mm. And um, these are kind of the, the ways. Uh, I, I think you have to cover that somehow because just yeah. having one, like for COVID, uh, it will never work like that. You know, um, I think that's, that's one of the main, main problems that we have this huge genetic diversity. And this have to be covered by the vaccine. And if you would follow an mRNA approach, you could, of course, combine uh, a B cell, epi B cell epitope, so the structural proteins with the non-structural, mm -hmm. probably not on one RNA molecule, but on several. Mm -hmm. yeah. And you could yeah. mix, of course, several genotypes to pr cover the, the, um, the genetic diversity uh, to some point. That seems like a, a challenge, a human challenge is really essential to develop Absolutely. this, right? So yeah. do you think it'll be approved eventually? I think the initiatives are very active. Yeah. Um, you think here in Germany you'll be able to do that? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, no. I think uh, uh, Germany is very sensitive about uh, mm. ethics and uh, whatever. But you could make a vaccine candidate, and, so, and it could be tested somewhere yes, else, yes, right? So that would be the idea. Yeah. But but um, I don't know. I, I don't think that you would get anything like that in to a German ethics approval. Mm. 
Yeah, I mean, the, the human challenge experiments are controversial. Even the one in the UK with SARS-CoV-2 was yeah, yeah, yeah. controversial because absolutely. you have long-term effects you don't yeah, know yeah, about, absolutely. Yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. And it can even be with Hep C. So yeah, it's like this immunological scar. Of course, you. Um, the problem is that you really have to. You can stop at any point, but you uh, you have to go on through persistence and mm. um, and of course uh, also for the people treated. Um, Let's say the liver is a very plastic organ; it can can kind of uh, recover quite mm -hmm. uh, quite good, but not beyond a certain point. Yeah. So um, if you treat people too late, uh, they still have an increased risk of HCC, so to develop develop cancer after after cure. Mm -hmm. So of course you mm. remove the the primary uh, kind of source of this inflammatory process, but when the liver is rebuilt too much to mm -hmm. a certain degree, you will not get a full recovery of the liver. So let's say in the fibrosis stage you can get to a normal uh, state, but when you go, go beyond that, you will also keep that um, uh, increased risk of liver cancer. Mm -hmm. um, and that's also one, one aspect um, to understand that better, because uh, even after treatment, many people have been treated at their late stages. You know, these transfusion, these people who got, it, got infected uh, by transfusions in the 70s uh, or 80s, uh, they got access to therapy um, if they weren't successful on interferon treatment, let's say in twenty after twenty sixteen, mm -hmm. um, and of course they they their liver disease typically has been progressed quite dramatically. Of course, many of them have died already. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but but um, um, let's say to understand the con how HCV beyond this chronic uh, inflama inflammatory process uh, um, contributes to liver cancer and how to probably prevent that also after cure. Uh, by understanding the mechanisms, uh, I think, uh, is, is still an, an, an open, important question. But those individuals who were infected for many years, you could still treat them with antivirals? Yeah, and, sure. Yeah. Although you say some may still progress to liver cancer at that yeah, point. Yeah, the, the problem is even after cure, even if yeah. you have uh, got rid of the virus, um, you can also get liver cancer from, from alcohol, you know. From, of course, uh, yeah, 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 sure. So, so it's, um, um, yeah. uh, the virus kind of... Uh, tries the inflammation to some degree and kind of in, it initiates processes that cannot be reverted completely even after cure. Got it. Um, and if the, as I said, it, 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 it depends on the earlier you treat, the better. The later, the more you, you, your, your risk might be maintained. Understood. Mm. I have a question going back to RNA. To, I, I, as far as I know, recombination does not occur with Hepatitis C virus, is that correct? No. Uh, you it think does. it does? It yeah. does, it does. Um, What's the frequency? Um, uh, very hard to say, to be honest, mm -hmm. because um, um, let's say the indications are, uh, there are several indications. First, um, there are even subgenomes found in liver, uh, in HIV patients. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you're replicants. You're my replicants. Yeah, they, they're a bit different because they all keep the capsid protein for the core. What's for what's reason. missing? The, the uh, envelope proteins. Okay. Up to NS2. Uh, so uh, this mm -hmm. is it's non-structural. It's called non-structural, but it's more important for particle production. But the capsid, the core, is still always maintained, and uh, it's hard to understand because the replicant doesn't need it. Um, so these deletions. Uh, also are often found in patients with, with a progressed liver disease. So this, it seems to like, contribute to pathogenesis to some extent. And there are some cases, it's, it's difficult in this kind of, uh, because it's, it's so, such a variable virus yeah. to, to, to track down recombination right. events. Yeah? Right. Uh, it's a swarm, it's a, we call it quasi-species, and it's really quasi-species, you know. And most of the genomes are defective anyways, which you find in the, in the body. And uh, it's very, very difficult to... to mm. um, uh, uh, and we we did some in vitro experiment where you could also show that it, it recombines, mm -hmm. but but um, so it's it's more about uh, it's it's not kind of classical recombination. It's more that the polymerase kind of uh, jumps at some point uh, to a different uh, uh, point of the of the template and then right. synthesizes. Well, it's the same as with polio virus. Yeah. The yeah. polymerase changes templates because they're close together in the replication complex. Yeah. But the interesting thing about polio is you can make changes in the polymerase that decrease the recombination rate because they make it. Uh, they make the polymerase more processive, I think, okay. and they mm -hmm. go past regions that induce the, the switch. But you can't do that because you don't have different molecules that will re both replicate well in cells, right? Yeah. So you can't look at that. But there have been a, a few isolates found uh, where it's clear that they have been recombination events between two different genotypes. 
So okay. from that, it's clear it happens. Mm -hmm. But I would not uh, dare to, uh, to to talk about the frequency. Right, because for, for enteroviruses, it's huge. A huge recombination frequency that generates new viruses that circulate globally. So okay. I'm wondering oh. what is the contribution to the global circulation of hep C, hep C by recombination, but you don't. I don't. I think, I we think can tell. Uh, uh, hepatic virus is rather on the side of uh, uh, making point mutations all the time. Mm -hmm. I said they are the most diverse group. Uh, I think uh, of, of all RNA viruses, and their strategy is rather to to generate a swarm of mutants and uh, to yep. to yep. adapt to changing environments by by this kind of individual mm -hmm. mutations. I noticed on your website that you start to work on norovirus. Is that right? Yes, I did. Uh, so I'm I'm still not uh, kind of. Uh, Let's say it was difficult enough to generate a cell culture model for HCV, and it's even more difficult for norovirus. Yeah, I was going to say you like to work on viruses that are hard to work with, right? Uh, yeah, actually, uh, the story is like uh, uh, I was on a positive strand RNA virus meeting, and mm -hmm. I was it was around 3 a.m. at a bar where I st stood with Peter White, uh, he's an Australian norovirus researcher, and one of his po uh, PhD students started here in Heidelberg, mm -hmm. uh, Grant Hansman, um, and he he kind of talked me into that I sh with my experience on replicants, I should give it a try with um, a norovirus. And this was 10 years ago. Uh, we still don't have a, a replicating model. It's, it's, a vi it's, 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 it's incredible. It's, it's a virus which makes you sick within a day mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with a few copies of incoming virus. Yeah. It replicates in, let's say, we still don't know exactly where it replicates. It's, it's, it's kind of a very specialized cells in the, in the intestine. The, the tuft cells? Uh, yeah. But, but um, let's say for the human norovirus, there are limited options to replicate it if you have it from stool. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there is no reverse genetics model and we are working on that now for 10 years and uh, following a similar approach but this was also a steep training curve because, um, <laughs> you know, coming from a persistent virus which doesn't harm to cell, a cell, going to an acute virus which kills the cell mm -hmm. eventually, mm -hmm. probably a selectable replicant might not be the favorable approach. Yeah, exactly. Right. <laughs> it will kill the cell. Yeah. yeah. Uh, hmm. But um, but but let's say we we're, we're following a similar approach, like um, trying to f find replication intermediates uh, in in cells um, we use mnv murano norovirus mm -hmm. as a training mm -hmm. model and also there it's um it's strange it's you know it, it has a um, it's like with uh, picona viruses they have a terminal protein vpg they don't have a cap and they have a very very small ntr three four mm -hmm. nucleotides and um, of course when we do reverse genetics we try to replace this protein by a cap that's what we can do uh, when we do this in a synthetic way um, and it seems that this cap uh, is not uh, a good replacement for the protein. And when you start with your reverse genetics, also for MNV, to create virus from that, the initial titer is not very high. Mm. So 1,000 copies per ml. It's, it's not, not mind-breaking. Um, and for MNV, of course, we have a cell culture model. We have mm. cells where we know we can infect them, and then it goes up. You know, For, for human norovirus, I think the limiting factor is we don't have any culturable cell with a receptor. Uh, so we cannot kind of expand this low mm -hmm. amount of virus mm -hmm. we, we, we get out. And um, we are on the track. I, I think we made some progress. I think we have, we have now clones um, that are replication competent. And it seems not that the replication uh, is a bottleneck. It's more this problem that we don't have this VPG linked to the genome, mm -hmm. which makes it very inefficient at the start. Um, mm. But... but um, uh, we made we made some progress. So uh, norovirus is one where we've already done human challenge experiments, uh, right? Very early. Yeah. <laughs> so that can be uh, a vaccine, but even then, you don't need that because you have so many people who are infected. You can test a vaccine, right? Yeah, norovirus vaccine would not. But, but we, here we have again the problem of the genetic diversity. Yeah. So um, yeah. so let's say um, for the last decade. Uh, uh, we have seen pandemics every three, four years, and they were caused by uh, strains from the same genotype or geno group. It's in floor as a geno group, G24. Yep. Yep. Um, and uh, first it was an isolate called, uh, I think, New Orleans. Then it was followed by Sydney. And we're still in the Sydney phase mm -hmm. now for 10 years. Right. right. Um, and mm -hmm. it's, but it, it, it shifts and, and it, it, like in, in, in influ a bit like an in influenza. So it makes, it, it comes up with mutations, causes new epidemics. So it means, Although almost all of us 
have passed through many norovirus infections, most mm. of them inherently, we're not protected. So here, again, the, mm. the problem is how to protect, how to make a yeah. protective vaccine. Uh, there are, of course, um, many, many labs working on that. Yeah. Um, and of course, there the, the challenge would not be uh, to, to find the right population to test it, but the challenge there is really to get an effective vaccine. Well, you have to start trying, and then yeah, you're yeah. never going to make any progress unless you do that. So, Absolutely. All right. Well, that is really interesting. Uh, that is a, a... By the way, any, any questions from you guys? This is your <laughs> chance. Yes. Actually, yes. Uh, just one curious question about the HCV uh, cure. You said that uh, people that were cured from HCV can get reinfected. Can you cure them again? Afterwards? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Okay, so this is basically a That's circle. not... Yeah, yeah. So you can, uh, let's say, in some cases you find some traces of resistance, so this can happen. But um, um, with this kind of three component uh, medication, uh, so targeting all three uh, um, kind of uh, targets which are uh, established, uh, it's still possible, I would say, in most cases. Anything else? <clears throat> all right, that's a special... TWIV here in Heidelberg. You can find the show notes at microbe.tv slash TWIV. You can send us questions and comments to TWIV at microbe.tv. And we would love to have your financial support for this work. Uh, we depend on you. Microbe TV, the, our parent company, is a nonprofit. And uh, we'd love to have your support. You can go to microbe.tv slash contribute. My guest today from the University of Heidelberg, Volker Lohmann. Thank you so much. Thank you, and yeah. it was a pleasure. Really, I admire really cool work with really hard systems, so <laughs> good for you. I'm as persistent as my viruses. Yeah, you are. Oh, that's a good title. <laughs> as persistent as my virus. Excellent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at microbe.tv. I'd like to thank the American Society for Virology, the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIV, Ron Jenkins for the music, and Jolene for the timestamps. And also thank all of you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven thousand people in the <laughs> for coming. Thanks so much. We, you have been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Woo!